back to the last session on the studio stage. We're finishing on a high note today. I'm delighted to introduce our final studio stage speaker, Brian Lee Jr., CEO and principal of Colocates Design, who will be sharing his success story with us today. So please join us in welcoming Brian to the stage. Hi, Brian. Thanks hey. for being here. Thank you, Joanne. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. I do appreciate it. Thank you. We're very excited to hear from you. I will hand it over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Brian C. Lee Jr. Uh, I'm a designer and architect with uh, Colocate Design. I'm the principal of Colocate Design in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and you know, our, our firm is based off of a general principle of design justice. I'll talk a little bit about what that is in a minute. But just to kind of anchor uh, the, the kind of principal argument, uh, the title of our, our firm is Co-Locate. It is a combination of colloquial and location, uh, the kind of sophisticatedly informal use of formal architectural language um, that is, is, is put in place and then location of a place. And so combining those things and thinking about the actual term Co-Locate, where it talks about the habitual juxtaposition of uh, one another with a greater frequency than chance, it means what things are important to us in this world, the people and places that exist in this world uh, at a higher frequency than chance. That's what our job is. Our job is to understand those things. It is to pair through them, to understand the uh, spatial and architectural implications uh, of that work, and then ultimately run a process that allows us to achieve uh, an architecture in response to, to, to those relationships and in, in, in response to those kind of conditions. Um, and so, I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about like the principles of our practice and then show you a few uh, kind of upcoming projects that are uh, really uh, aimed at, at seeing that through and, and talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the, the sticking points that allowed us to get from point A to point B. Um, the first is that, you know, our, our job is to understand the relationship between power and place. Uh, for us, we always acknowledge the fact that the history of all revolutions is based in blood and land. It is the landlord versus the landless. It is always a, a combination of, of power dynamics. Uh, in our work, in our architecture, our conversation is always wrapped around uh, a collective set of values. Those collective sets of values are validated through the spaces and places that we design. And so an acknowledgement for us is that in a racist, sexist, ableist uh, system and systems that cause harm, uh, we create monuments to those, those, those who cause harm uh, through the built environment. So what can we do to challenge the existing set of norms and values that exist in our work so that we can actually produce a work that serves the communities that are historically disinherited from the process of creating place? And then lastly, care. Um, design justice is what love looks like in public space. This is crib from Dr. Cornell West, but really it's talking about uh, the fact that spatial design should be a deep, deep, deep reflection of our, uh, of our expression of care through a beloved or with a beloved community. Right. And so in order to be in a beloved community, one has to be in community. You have to actually have to build in systems and protocols that allow you to actually have conversations uh, beyond our typical uh, design process. And so that's what we've done. We tried to build a process that acknowledges that. And what design justice really just simply says is that for nearly every injustice we see in this world, there's an architecture design, a plan that is used to sustain it. And so we ask through the design process to think about how can we be radical? And by that, how do we get to the root of the issues that we're trying to solve and, and make a little dent? Even if it's not, the, it's not solving the world, it is uh, making a dent in, the, in the, the, the larger problem. Can we repair? So reparations, is there a way that there's a, a reparative act that is uh, brought to bear through the work that we do? Um, and then the process and outcomes, and it's really what we're here to talk about today, uh, it's not enough just to have an outcome. There's a process that is necessary for those outcomes to be long lasting and to impact people for generations to come. Uh, and then lastly, can we uh, see design justice as a tool to challenge privilege of power structures? All of these things are, exist outside of the, the kind of normal processes of architecture. And so the more that we can mitigate and, and, and kind of chop down the uh, extraneous processes, uh, and really uh, allow ourselves to do that good work, uh, the better off we will be. 
And so we exist in this space where we call on uh, what we call the signals and receivers of a particular place and understand that our work as a design practice does not just simply exist in the project frame. It has to acknowledge procedures and policies and pedagogies that exist in a world, how, we, how we've been trained, the laws and procedures that exist that define, uh, define our relationship to the built environment, how we've set up our practices, uh, and then ultimately the communities that we choose to serve. Are we only serving those with, uh, with you know, bank accounts that are elite, or are we serving communities that uh, are, are a little bit more, uh, not just diverse, but um, impacted by the built environment in ways that we're not generally able to acknowledge. And so there comes the practice, right? So for us, uh, our work uh, in a design justice practice uh, encompasses a little bit of social practice and community design centers and for-profit practice uh, at different scales, right? Uh, and so a design justice practice for us really asks us to, to think about the phasing of work that acknowledges that outreach and organizing is a tremendous, tremendous uh, part of this. Uh, the early, obviously, the early programming and pre-design is 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 critical, uh, and that uh, the the standard scope of services should lead to some version of advocacy that uh, tells us how we can be better in our process. Not just that we completed a process, but how can we be better in it? Uh, and so, I think part of the work today is just to kind of show you, or at least talk about how. Uh, we've been impacted by uh, you know, simplifying some of our processes to allow that to happen. Um, so again, just to kind of capture all of that, we are a design justice practice, but we are also a nonprofit. And so as a, as a kind of condition of the, the nonprofit status, uh, we are subject to doing work from the lens of uh, a civic, cultural, communal space. We're, we're kind of a social justice organization um, by nature. And that means that we focus on uh, spaces that are directly derived or around kind of public service, public knowledge, public health, public exchange, uh, whether that is workforce centers uh, in the Northwest and foster care facilities or, um, you know, libraries, cultural facilities in uh, in, in New Orleans, or um, again, cultural facilities in in the in the Northeast, we've been kind of across the country working on this, but staying relatively close to the to the center of gravity that is uh, our our overall uh, mission. Uh, and in that mission, uh, it is it is necessary to push just a little bit past what we uh, deem as sufficient. Uh, in, in our work oftentimes, which is just an equality framework, because equality only asks us to affirm that there's a fairness moving forward. And so our ask as a practice and really to everyone in this field is to think a little bit past that, uh, past equity uh, into justice. And justice asks us to repair for those past injustices, but also more importantly, to remove barriers to, I guess, uh, to progress moving forward. Uh, and so that means as a practice, how do we actually take the tools that we're given to simplify and remove barriers to people actually making change? Uh, because the systems that we deal with are so complicated and complex. Uh, what happens when we simplify them to a point that we can actually uh, do the work that we say we intend to do, that we can live into the aspirations that often many of us went into to architecture school to, to consider? Um, and then lastly, I ask people to kind of push towards liberation. This is the hardest part of it all because it's not just simply removing barriers to progress, but it is affirmatively influencing the future outcomes uh, of, of our work, right? And so what does that mean, right? What does it mean to actually uh, uh, build an architecture or think about an architecture or a practice or, or a process that uh, influences the outcomes of the individuals involved over the course of that process, but, uh, but, but fundamentally creates a conduit or a, a, a space that serves a, a longer term purpose. Uh, and I think those are the things that we, we really try to, to bring forward in some of the architecture that we do. So I'll tell you just briefly, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I wanna tell you just briefly um, some stories about the work that, that we've done, whether that is small scale uh, art and exhibition stuff uh, using, again, simplified uh, planning, 
uh, using the software for, for simplified planning processes that allow us to actually manage some of these, these workflows uh, and to do them in a creative way because our, our workflow is not necessarily always typical to, uh, to a standard scope of services. Uh, but this is a project called Paper Monuments in New Orleans. Um, I want you to, to think back to a few years ago where you saw uh, Bree Newsom maybe uh, pull down the South Carolina flag, Confederate or the Confederate flag um, in South Carolina. Uh, it set off this, it sparked this kind of conversation around racist monuments across the entire country. One of those projects, one of the projects that we, we worked on in conjunction with organizers here in New Orleans was to remove racist monuments from our landscape. Uh, and it, as a result of that work, uh, we did a project called Paper Monuments that took a lot of the stories that we see uh, today and tried to put them back into the world. Um, and so uh, I say this to say there is an implementation of, of small scale uh, into the world. But, but more importantly, uh, when we talk about removing barriers to progress, uh, part of this was that you know, we engage with both City Hall, we engage with the libraries, we engage with cultural institutions across the city to get a large, large number of proposals from people across uh, the entire uh, city. So nearly 10,000 people uh, engaged in this process to tell us what they think new monuments might look like in the city. And to manage that process is unwieldy. So to make sure that we had the time, the money, the capabilities to kind of push those things forward uh, was, was truly uh, evident in, in the way that this process, uh, you know, with a small budget was able to, to, to push out. There were over 50 pr uh, posters that were created. There are 10 uh, living uh, monuments that, that went up uh, in this moment. Uh, and it was a, a great small little project uh, to move forward. Uh, another project, smaller project, but again, when we talk about removing barriers and creating processes that, that challenge systems, uh, this is the Claiborne Innovation District here in New Orleans, Louisiana. It's a 19 block marketplace that uh, exists in uh, underneath or that will exist underneath this um, uh, highway that cut through a historically African-American neighbor, neighborhood, the oldest African-American neighborhood in, in the country. Uh, and this project really, really sought to uh, not just hire uh, inside uh, the, the kind of profession, but to hire what we call community design advocates and to put them uh, within the process as well and to make sure that they were paid accordingly. And so to be able to track and, and move and maneuver all of those hours to make sure that 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 is flexible and in uh, the, the kind of constraints of our general process was a big task, but to bring that to bear uh, in the work was really, really beautiful to see. This project uh, is moving forward with the groundbreaking in November, uh, but it's gonna be a long 10 year process to, to kind of feel, to fill all of those blocks. Another project that we're doing, which has a similar uh, conditional uh, uh, consideration, which is, uh, in conjunction with the New Orleans African American Museum, uh, which takes on a project called the Storia, the Storia Pavilion. Uh, it really is uh, a simply a way to kind of talk about the, the larger story of, of uh, uh, communities that have been dispersed by way of our work as professionals, right? So how can you actually build something that, that offers a moment to reflect on uh, what was lost a moment to kind of recon, uh, reconvene people in various ways uh, and provide a reflection or an image uh, of people, a monument to the people, to the communities that, that uh, were and are still here. Um, to uh, a broader um, uh, kind of smaller bridge pavilion uh, process that is really reflecting on the stories of indigenous people across the city of New Orleans. All of these projects are projects that, uh, again, adamantly consider the, the communities that, that we serve. They adamantly consider uh, the landscapes that we're, we're, uh, we're engaged in. Uh, and ultimately, uh, they speak to a, a really the, the kind of local voice uh, and how you might challenge local processes, uh, how you might challenge local narratives. Um, to kind of really embed stories that are that are true to true to place, true to the people who exist in this city, true to the people who are engaged uh, in these sites, uh, and and make them real for everyone. Um, and 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 lastly, I'll, I'll talk about one other project, which is a high school 
uh, in in Brooklyn, which is again still a ways out, but uh, in concept, uh, is really reflecting a process that uh, really goes all the way up to uh, to to politicians at the at the national level. Can we create an ecosystem for a high school that thinks about education that exists beyond uh, beyond a, a singular the walls? Uh, a much further uh, scope of individuals. Um, this is a project that attempted to do that and is still in the process of, of, of aiming uh, for, for that. And so I say all of this to acknowledge that our lives are a, a ton easier by having uh, processes that have allowed us to be uh, fundamentally uh, more efficient with our work, uh, for us to focus on the things that we deem to be valuable, which really are community voices uh, in this process, uh, and to make sure that those voices are lifted in the work. Uh, and the more that we can kind of relieve ourselves of the uh, of the, the the day in day out work that that uh, often is the logistics of running a practice, um, the more we can do things like these uh, these projects, which are lovely for us. They're not the built work, but they are the work that we aspire to, uh, to to continue to do it at a, at, a, at a really high level. And these projects are all in process of being built. And so I think, again, it, it's allowed us the freedom to, to, to do work that we really truly believe in uh, and, and believe in really uh, believe will make an impact on the world in a real way. So uh, thank you for giving me a moment of your time to kind of talk about our work and, and what it might look like to, to uh, again, be more efficient in this type of work, which is what design justice calls on us to do. Oh, oh, thanks, Brian. That was amazing. I love all the work you're doing. All your projects look so beautiful. Oh, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, let's see what they get up in the world, some of these new ones <laughs> in the world. So. We can't wait to see them build.